Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today I'm going to present one of my videos from my new channel, Research Flat Moon. Now, this has been released over there, but I wanted to go ahead and put it up on my main channel to get it a little bit more exposure and maybe encourage you to go over and give me a like and a subscribe on my new channel. So, let's go ahead and go on with the presentation. You know, one of my favorite subjects in the Flat Earth is dealing with pseudo-intellectuals. And the king of the pseudo-intellectuals in Flat Earth is one quantum eraser, or as I like to say, questionable education. Today, what I'd like to do is go to his website and learn a little bit about quantum eraser. Now, going to his website, you'll see his About Me section, and he's got quite a little resume, it seems. He has an extensive background in quantum mechanics, genetics, and biochemistry. Retired military with half my career spent in reconnaissance and the other half on need to know. This is kind of interesting because I've actually seen his Facebook page in the past. He's got pictures of him as an E4 in the Army. Uh, well done, I was an E4 in the Army. And then it also has pictures of him as a captain in the Army, or at least wearing a captain's uniform. So I always thought that was kind of interesting. So besides having some delusions of grandeur here, well, let's have a look at his flat earth proofs. The black swan light, the Bolivian salt flats, the sea sparrow missile, the Coriolis effect, and the no vacuum of space. So let's cue up the music and have a look at his six proofs of the flat earth. Well, the first one, of course, is the infamous black swan argument. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use his actual argument here as he states it and then kind of take it down. So let's have a look. Unfortunately, his argument is about as good as his web design skills. The black swan argument is a modus tollens. That means that if P, then Q, if not Q, then not P. That does make some sense. For example, if the Earth is a sphere, then the shortest distance between two points on the surface of the sphere will be a great circle. The shortest distance between two points on the Earth is not a great circle. Therefore, the Earth is not a sphere. Now, the basis of this argument is that if P, then Q, if not Q, then we can use inductive reasoning that P is also not true. So here's the problem that we run into with this. In order for the modus tollens to work, you have to have a true statement and a true premise. So for example, if the Earth is a sphere, the shortest distance between any two points on that surface of a sphere would be a great circle. That is a true statement. The shortest distance between two points on the Earth is not a great circle. Therefore, the Earth is not a sphere. That is not true. The shortest distance between any two points on the Earth is indeed a great circle. So untruthfully saying that it is not simply to validate your premise, your P, is not a valid modus tollens argument. His argument is that if the Earth is a sphere with a radius of 3959 miles, which is P, then every horizon distance must be no more than 1.225 times the square root of the observer's height in feet. That is a false statement. Now, the reason that this no more than is an incorrect statement and must be replaced with no less than, because the Earth is a sphere with an atmosphere, we have refraction present. Refraction will extend the horizon a distance beyond the geometric horizon. It can actually extend it quite a bit, as we shall see. The problem with his argument is that by making this subtle change, he is making an invalid argument and an invalid statement of fact. When you're dealing with an observation such as this, where you have massive refraction going on, as you can see by the flame booms, and looming, 
the horizon itself will also be extended. So using quantum erasers argument that the visual horizon must be co-located with the geometric horizon, whether refraction is present or not. The logical conclusion of this argument is that every observation that we make over the surface of the Earth in the presence of an atmosphere would fail his test for spherosity. When in reality, we understand refraction very well, and in the vast majority of observations we make where we're dealing with normal refraction, we can exactly determine where the horizon would be, and we can predict it, in fact. Notice that not only did he have a flawed argument, he's making a flawed observation here. He's taking advantage of refraction by making an observer height of one foot to maximize the amount of refraction that is present in the atmosphere, and then claiming that the Earth fails the test for sphericity. Now, once again, he's promoting an incorrect argument. For example, he's saying that the observer height is eight feet, and then he claims that the maximum distance the geometric horizon can be on a sphere is 3.46 miles. This, again, is an incorrect statement. This should read, the minimum distance to the horizon will be 3.46 miles, but it could be greater due to refraction. And indeed, it is. Now, because he's using a flawed premise, he's going to have a flawed conclusion. Now, because these are very simple arguments and the flaws in them are quite obvious, I'm going to do a series of short videos taking each argument in turn. Now, we'll see this misuse of the moldus tollens argument in future episodes, but for right now, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Remember, don't take any wooden nickels and don't listen to pseudo-intellectuals for your scientific knowledge. Take care, guys. Bye.